The deeds of the leader shall live on in the hard-won glory of his exploits. This alone endures. This alone escapes the obscurity of death. This is certainly true of General George S. Patton. His electrifying dash through France and the liberation of Europe will be remembered as long as courage is honored as a human virtue. It's hard to believe that George S. Patton, Jr., the General Hitler and the Nazis feared the most, was, once upon a time, just plain Georgie. But even during his earliest years, this lad believed that one day he would be a notable general. In keeping with family tradition, Patton began his military career at the same school both his father and grandfather had attended, the Virginia Military Institute. After a year, he transferred to West Point, where he proved to be a model cadet, despite the fact that, much like Washington and Napoleon, he could not spell. It was during this time that Patton began forming strong ideas about the proper conduct of a military man. From this point on, rarely would he flash his attractive smile. In order to encourage others to adopt his standards, he established the first football team for soldiers to keep them from drinking and gambling during off hours. During World War I, Patton saw his first tank. Convinced that this ponderous vehicle was the future of warfare, Patton studied it earnestly. He rode into battle on it and became a hero alongside it. As our first tank commander, he would always be linked with the weapon that symbolized his powerful and unrelenting personality. After the war, Patton was assigned to the tank school at Fort Meade, where he met and became friends with others who shared his deep interest in things military. Among them, a young officer named Dwight Eisenhower. Soon, it was time for millions of American soldiers to don the clothing of battle once more. In November of 1942, Major General George S. Patton, Jr. was in command of the Western Force of Operation Torch, the Allied invasion of North Africa. One of the outstanding features of the brief campaign was Patton's bold leadership and later, the favorable impression he created on the French and the Arabs alike. Long-range plans began to be discussed, plans which would cast America's toughest general in a leading role. Meanwhile, to the east, in Tunisia, the battle raged on. Assigned command of the U.S. Second Corps, Patton kindled the fighting spirit of his men as they entered the fray. Allied leaders such as British General Harold Alexander sensed Patton's remarkable military gifts, his judgment and his sure instinct for what the enemy would do. Patton set a tank trap for Hitler's General Erwin Rommel, who promptly marched right into it. His 10th Panzer Division lost half of its 60 tanks. The damage was so extensive, Rommel never attempted a counterattack. Patton's reputation as being tough and audacious grew. He eagerly anticipated his next campaign, commanding a new army, the 7th, slated for the liberation of Sicily. An order of the day from Patton to his men. Remember that we, as attackers, have the initiative. We must retain this tremendous advantage by always attacking. Rapidly, ruthlessly, viciously, without rest. Keep punching. God is witness, we shall win. Patton's strategy for fighting any battle was attack, attack, and when in doubt, attack again. 
His chief mission, he believed, was to boost the morale of his men. He urged them on, certain that speed and boldness could shorten the war. Like British General Bernard Montgomery, Patton believed in showmanship, but was aware that if the act could not be carried off in fine style, the men would see through it. Patton used every means available to inspire his troops. Sicily proved to be a model campaign. Sound tactics and a fighting spirit won the island in 38 days. His old friend Dwight Eisenhower, now Supreme Allied Commander, paid a visit. Passionately involved in his work, Patton had acquired a reputation for being tempestuous and sometimes rash. There was a question as to his role in the invasion of Fortress Europe. Then, his whereabouts carefully concealed from the German high command, he appeared in Great Britain. New troops heard him in an introductory speech and called him old blood and guts. The veteran soldiers referred to him as the old man. They said he knew more about fighting than any man alive. He told them to get mad and stay mad. They listened. Day behind Bradley's first army, another army assembled, Patton's third. With plenty of armor, this outfit was like its commander, fast, hard-hitting, spirited, spectacular. On the Sherbrooke Peninsula, Patton began a rolling advance, an all-out smashing attack, his version of the German Blitzkrieg. Blood and Guts had said, the harder we push, the more Nazis will kill. And the more Nazis we kill, the fewer of our men will be killed. Pushing means fewer casualties. The third took Patton at his word and found out he was right. of towns occupied by Germans one day and liberated the next. At the head of a vast crusading army, a man fulfilling a destiny he had dreamed of since early youth. The attacks were now in all directions at once, south, north, and east toward Germany. The third advanced like a wave crashing over the enemy. He told his men that in the last two weeks they had advanced farther and faster than any other army in history. But Patton, always pushing and striving to make the impossible a reality, told his men it was his intention to move farther and faster still. Outrunning its maps, the third crossed the Seine. Patton said he was touring Europe with an army. He was everywhere at once, covering the great distances within his command. The use of light aircraft exemplified his eagerness, his willingness to explore any new means of increasing efficiency. Throughout, the 19th Tactical Air Command of the 8th Army Air Force gave incredibly close support to the 3rd. The astounding advances went on and on. 
Patton saw no obstacles. He was ready to push on into the heart of Nazi Germany. Struggling to keep up with his fast-moving front was a miraculous supply effort known as the Red Ball Express. But now, Patton's supply lines were strained to the limit. Winter was approaching. Other Allied armies were feeling the pinch, and the Third was told to halt their advance and take up defensive positions. Nothing short of defeat itself could have weighed more heavily on the General's heart. This was a difficult time for an army built to roll. The tension eased a bit when word came through that the Third would eventually receive adequate supplies to finish what they had started, to continue their drive toward Berlin. Patton urged his field commanders to try to keep intact the high level of morale that was created during the offensive. He himself spoke to the men, delivering the pep talks for which he was famous, giving credit, instilling pride, keeping their spirits up. Then word arrived from headquarters. Patton was given the go-ahead for an attack on Metz. In 400 years, this fortress city had withstood every assault. But Patton was intent on making history of his own, and before long, the Third Army had conquered the unconquerable. However, victory came at a price. now for a great drive toward the infamous Siegfried Line. But an instinct for what the enemy will do alerted him to a new danger. His instincts proved accurate when German Field Marshal Gerd von Randstedt struck with 20 divisions along a 40-mile front in the Ardennes, the Battle of the Bulge. Eisenhower, Knowing he was asking the impossible, called for Patton and the Third to be there in three days. They made it in two. Dashing 100 miles over icy roads toward Bastogne, which had been surrounded by the Nazis, Patton's concentrated armor drove hard and fast, relieving the city and disrupting the German advance. Once again, the enemy was on the defensive. In Patton's book, they were destined to fail. The third broke the back of the German offensive and began preparations for one of their own. As always, old blood and guts pushed them harder than anyone had ever pushed them before. The result was a payoff greater than any had expected. polished boots, the ivory-handled revolvers, and the profanity were all part of his posturing. He projected toughness. Flamboyance and aggression were qualities he believed were the makings of a successful general. Patton believed in recognizing and exalting the heroic qualities of his men. To him, words like duty, patriotism, and loyalty had real meaning, and his men 
sensed his sincerity. The Siegfried Line, a string of defenses Patton referred to as a monument to the stupidity of man cracked easily. The famous third was now on the loose again, on a spring rampage that would bring the war to a close before summer. Again, Patton's army was going beyond expectations. The enemy believed that Patton would pause at the Rhine. He went right across. Now, along a wide front, his divisions fought toward their final goal. Always he took time out to give credit where it really belonged to the men. To Private Harold A. Garment, the Medal of Honor. Exalting sacrifice, Patton never dwelled long on the horrors of war. But as his Third Army overran concentration camps in Germany, he saw a horror of a new kind. Even to a hardened military man, it was an abomination, an insult to humanity. It was over. Briefly, Patton relaxed his carefully maintained military bearing and allowed himself to enjoy the moment. On his return, Americans showed their gratitude. Los Angeles went all out in its reception. With him was General Doolittle, whose Eighth Air Force did so much to assure final victory. to win, Patton watched Americans compete on the playing field. Again, he saw the fighting spirit, the will to win, a quality he loved and admired and which he epitomized himself. Struggle was the test of a man. War, the supreme struggle, provided the highest test. expected his own death to be spectacular. In this one prediction, he was mistaken. He died of injuries received in an automobile accident four months after the end of the war. He was buried among the men of the Third Army who had fallen in the Battle of the Bulge.
Patton lived for action and glory and reached the heights serving his country. He was a keen student of war and the psychology of war. In General Pershing's words, it didn't hurt America to have a general so bold that he was dangerous. Patton was a military hero in the classic tradition and his place is secure as one of the great generals in military history. A remarkable man, a remarkable life, George S. Patton, Jr., a hero.